See that building right there? That building right there. Turn right. That's the famous Pear Street apartment uh, that Kurt Cobain lived in with his future bandmate, Dave Grohl. That's the uh, Washington State Lottery building on the other side. You'll see it in my other videos about Kurt when he used to shoot the BB gun at the windows. But that's it right there. But I'm stopped here at this corner for a very important reason. I know you're gonna dig this. Get, get, fu get funky with me. Everybody, how you doing today? So here I am in Olympia, Washington. I just showed you that Washington State Lottery building. So walked right from the Pear Street apartment to this building right here. This used to be an AM PM back in the day. Now Dave Grohl talks about in his book how he used to. You know what? I don't want to explain this. I want someone else to explain it. Explain it. I want someone else to explain it to me. And I want someone else to take me all around Olympia and show me the coolest Kurt Cobain places that maybe not a lot of people know about. I'm talking album covers, where they first play, so, a whole bunch of stuff. So the person I chose is... This is my buddy, I call him Johnny Nirvana. Buddy Johnny B, but we'll call him Johnny Nirvana for the video. You lived in Olympia for about six years, back in the same time period as Kurt was here. That's right. So you're going to take me to all these Kurt Cobain places, and should I give it away that you actually, you did know Kurt? Yeah. You played on the same bill as Kurt? We're, we're going to visit one of the spots where I played a show with Nirvana, yeah. Yeah. And where are we right now? Uh, well, we're actually at the old AM PM gas station, and uh, Dave Grohl actually mentions this spot in his book because it's across the street from uh, Kurt Cobain's Pear Street apartment. So right. It's right a stone's throw from here. But he talks about how he was living on three for a dollar corn dogs that he would buy here at this AM PM. And uh, also talks about uh, the number of uh, corn dog sticks were so prolific that they were piled up literally in the apartment. Right. So, um, you know, you were either going to step on a live turtle or a pile of corn dog sticks. <laughs> That's crazy. But, but uh, it was it was cool. We actually met the guy who's in charge of turning this into a marathon gas station, and he actually let us inside and everything right. so we could kind of relive. Just... But you know, sadly, no corn dogs. Yeah. So yeah. here's that footage right now. Yeah. Of me going inside. We were just inside a second ago. Gas and then the store brand will be Royal Mart. Where are they? All right, so that was us aside. Johnny, yeah. let's go somewhere else having to do with Nirvana. You choose, let's go. Okay. I'll drive. I'm thinking uh, let's go show everybody where the cover for the album Bleach was photographed. Awesome. Let's do it. All right, Johnny, I'm ready to do this, but. I don't care how tacky it is. Okay. Oh, you shouldn't have. Do it up. Look at that. Yep, that works. What? Tell me about this place. What is this? Okay, let's talk about this. We are in downtown Olympia in front of 112 East 4th Avenue. Now, why is this building significant? This is the site of the former Rico Muse. I've also heard it pronounced Reco Muse. But as far as uh, I, you know, my knowledge, it was the Rico Muse. I actually played one of the last shows they ever had here. But this was like a gallery and performance space. Uh, this is the site of a Nirvana show where Kurt's girlfriend at the time, Tracy Miranda, actually took a photograph of the band on stage, which later was used as the cover for the Nirvana Bleach album. 
Wow. And uh, from what I understand, Nirvana had gone in to do a professional photo shoot in the studio and were kind of, you know, posing these studio shots and everything. And they hated the result. And uh, then they played a show here, actually with a friends of mine band called Hell Trout, which were a phenomenal band. And uh, yeah, Tracy just snapped a couple of shots of the band. They loved them. The rest is history. Wow. And the entrance to it was here on this side? Yeah. Right now, the entrance is around the side on the front sidewalk. But from what I recall, remember, folks, it has been almost 30 years. A little <laughs> hazy. But uh, from what I remember, there was actually an entrance right here on the side. And uh, you went in about where that Protect Your Community mural is. And then the stage was kind of right here in the middle. But uh, all kinds of bands played played here. Um, I think D uh, Dave Grohl's DC hardcore band, I think Scream actually played. Oh yeah? Yeah. When he came to Olympia. When he came to Olympia, Bikini Kill for your Riot Girl fans. Uh, I actually think Kathleen Hanna of Bikini Kill was a part owner or operator of the Rico Muse. But uh, you know, hey, you know, internet land, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure that's the truth. Right, now, so the, they would have sealed it up pretty well. What, let's just take a look at the new entrance. Yeah, there's a doorway you right see, there. Yeah, you can see the crack in the foundation and how there's new cement there. That probably, that was the entrance door. Okay, that makes sense. Perfect. Oh, it's a karate school now. So, oh, it's a um, nice looking building. Yeah, I think it's actually, this might be, um... It oh, it's not a karate school. It's a, it's empty. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, signs here about like uh, trans youth and Stonewall youth and stuff like that. Right. So, I'm not sure, but maybe it was some kind of activist, uh, community activist. Thing. Yeah. Well, yeah, protect your community on the outside. Yeah. Which is a really actually fitting use for the old Rico Muse space. Right. You know? So they put the entrance way right here. Yeah. Okay. Stonewall Youth. So this is like a place. I hope it's still open for kids to come if they're having trouble with anything. Pretty much. Yeah. There it is. Let's take another shot here yeah. if I can see it. There it is. There. So the stage would have been right back there. Take a look through this lens here. Right back that way, right? Yeah, it would have been uh, to the left of that shot, kind of against against that wall, yeah. That's where bleach was taken. That's wow. where the bleach photo was taken. Wild. All right, we're going somewhere else, right? You got something good for me? Yeah. Where are you? Uh, oh, hi, <laughs> yeah, oh, hold on. Yeah, um, so the next stop, we're going to go to the site of where Dave Grohl Played with Nirvana at a show for the very, very first, first time. What? what first of all, that we got the street wrong or the other place, right? You said, dude. I told you it's been a lot of years, and you know. Uh, I don't want to self-incriminate here, but you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> Work with me. Uh, anyway, yeah, the the other address, of the Rico Muse, was 112 East State Street. Right. So yeah, it's actually State Street is the same street that uh, the pair apartment yeah, is just right, drives right, right onto State yeah. Street. So we got that corrected. Yeah. Okay. Now this is amazing. Right. This place. We are here now, uh, New Caledonia. Uh, it's a kind of a fancy tea shop, so you wouldn't know that at one time this was the site of the North Shore Surf Club uh, in October, I think it was October 11th, 1990. This is the site of the first gig that Dave Grohl actually was playing with Nirvana. We're going to let this track out. Never fails. Never fails. October 11th, 1990, site of the first show Dave Grohl ever back in Nirvana. Now they announced the show at the very last minute. Um, it's only a 300 capacity club. Last minute announcement, it's sold out within 24 hours. Because they had quite a hype around them in here. There was, there was some hype about the show, uh, definitely. 
and uh, there was a line around the venue to get in, prompting Dave Grohl to actually call home to his mom and tell her how excited he was that there was actually a line to get in to see his show. Wow. Um, now, let's see, what else can I say about this? Oh yeah, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the power, the volume was so loud that it actually blew the circuit a couple of times. They had to pause the show and uh, Dave Grohl being that Neanderthal monster hitter that he was, um, adding that new ferocity to Nirvana and tightness, broke a snare drum too in the middle of the set. Really? Yeah, and he had to like uh, replace his, his snare. But um, yeah. Uh, legend, legendary show, and you got to realize, you know, pre-internet kids and everything, it wasn't so easy. You couldn't buy tickets just by going on and hitting no, the button you had or something. To, no. You had to actually physically show up at a record store or at the venue to buy a ticket. And a lot of times in those days, like people would actually camp out overnight. in front of the yeah. store overnight waiting to get tickets. Yeah. So for a local show to sell out in less than a day is actually a pretty big deal back then. Let's see if we can go away. Let's see what yeah. happens, what they say to us. Yeah, let's see. Who knows? Yeah, it looks like uh, it's took a turn for the bougie from the yeah. uh, from the surf club. So here we are inside now. So yeah. do you, do, I mean, this you've been in here back in the day. It's obviously wow. completely different. It's a bunch this of stores. Is super fancy compared to just the pure rock and roll sludge and grunge atmosphere that you would have met. Um, now, I'm trying to remember. It seemed to me that you entered and the stage was here and there was just a big graffiti uh, backdrop that said North Shore Surf Club. You can actually see the video um, on YouTube. There's a video of the North Shore show. And you know, another thing, uh, I saw a very young Green Day. Yeah, you were telling North me that Shore yesterday. Yeah, that's crazy. Back in 1991, they tore this place up. Another legendary uh, local band you know, the Melvins, of course, um, saw them many times yeah. here at the North Shore. And uh, I mean, they just rattled my skull in such a good way, <laughs> such a good way. Anyway, you're, so on, you're this, on holy ground for Nirvana yeah, fans. This is, it would have been right here, you're saying, the stage? Well, see, once remember? again, it's so hazy because now that I'm seeing the entrance here, I'm actually thinking that I, you know, once again, I don't think we can count on Johnny Nirvana for this detail. <laughs> if there's someone out there that was at the show or knows, let me know. But where the stage I mean, was? The entrance were here, so it probably the stage was. Yeah, makes sense. Well, yeah, stage at the at back. The back. The club. Usually yeah. a bar alongside. Yeah. You know, on either side type I mean, of thing. I, I haven't been in here in 30 years. So. Yeah, but I mean, it's complete. I, I'm sure there was a what do you call this? A giant sunlight. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's uh, that's a very fancy new addition. Yeah. I mean, and of course, if you know anything about Olympia and the weather, like kind of the idea of even building a sunlight is kind of a little bit ironic because there's such a lack of it. <laughs> well, that nice weather, but I've been here. Oh, for, in July. This yeah, is, this yeah, is sure. paradise yeah. on earth. Yeah. It's beautiful. All right, so where's the next location? Well, I think we're Won't give it away, but... I think, I, think uh, I don't know, should we record store next? Yeah. I think uh, we're gonna go uh, visit Rainy Day Records. They were originally located on the west side out more. Hey, look at, wow, look at the shirt. Yeah. They were originally out on the west side, but they have a new location here on the east side, Olympia, and uh, they have an amazing wall of flyers from back in the day. I know you'll love it. Let's do it. This is not the original location. That was actually, um, over on the west side, closer to Evergreen. This is the newer location, so, you know, Kurt or any of those guys wouldn't have shopped here. Right. The reason we're here is because the owner of the store has uh, um, kept and maintained kind of a glorious collection of flyers from back Original today, flyers. Including the original flyer from the first show Dave Grohl played with Nirvana. I'm we're going to see it here in a sec. Let's do it. Oh, they're all up there. Yeah, you can see them. How's it going? Okay, so up here above the uh, oh, yeah, Melvin's, checkout counter, Nirvana. you can see the one kind of bottom right there. You go down to this one right there on that bottom left. North Shore Surf Club. Yeah, that's the very first show they played with Dave Cole. October 11th, 1990. That's Five right. bucks. Hey, I, wow, I got the date right. That's <laughs> a miracle. But you can also see shows there. Bikini the Kill, the Nirvana with the Melvins, right. yeah. Wow. Even a show they played at Capitol Lake, which was a really strange place to see Nirvana. Beautiful location.
Okay. Yeah. Right here, what are we looking at? The cover of Bleach, man. Yeah. And uh, they used the photo, uh, photo negative there for the cover. Yeah. But this was the shot taken at the Rico Muse. 112 East State Street. See, I got it right. Yeah, time. flip it over. Yeah. What's that? Oh, there's okay. So the, there's other pictures you can find there's from other pictures inside, but that that's the yeah. photo we're talking about. In fact, I'm gonna buy this lovely piece of wax. You're gonna buy it right now? Oh yeah. Doing it. Oh, I'm pulling the trigger. Yeah, I'm getting this right now. Oh, no recess. Actually, no recess. Yeah, You're buying it. First time I ever heard this album. Someone actually, I was sitting in my mod out at the Evergreen State College, just noodling, playing some like you know, shredding band handling or something. And this like stoner kid walked up to my window and he's like, "Bro, that style's so over." And he just throws a copy of Nirvana Bleach right in my lap. And he's like, "You know." That's it. Yeah, I'm doing you a favor, bro. Oh, look at this. We have lots of REM. Look at this. I know what I'm going to say, but where's REM? Here's say one. one REM. Okay, okay. Weird. Okay, so here's another one for you, kids. Uh, amazing. That's Chad, the original drummer. Okay. Well, not the original drummer. Uh, no, Dave the was original the original drummer, Dave Foster. But yeah. uh, Chaos FM Live. Chaos is the radio station that broadcasts from the Evergreen State College. We're actually going to go out there here in a minute. Right. But this is the album. It's, this is a recording of that show that they did at the Evergreen State College radio station. Nice. Yeah. Legend. What else we got here? Let's see. I would love to buy all this wax right now. Dude, I know. I Bring it back to Toronto. Yeah. Live at the Pier. 1993 yeah. in Utero, live oh, at the Paramount. Paramount. Oh, that's Show famous. Is legend. Is in... Yeah, I gotta do it. Oh my god, is that Paul McCartney? They've got Paul McCartney's face. <laughs> <laughs> that is so funny. That's a thumbnail right there. Yeah, Sir Paul. <laughs> She's got Cut Here, which is one of the greatest your songs you'll ever hear cut here you bought the chaos I thought you just bought Bleach. look at this I chaos. just I just bought the live on chaos look at this proud supporter of chaos Olympia Community you Radio. really are yeah that's broadcasting from the Evergreen State College I can't believe it's right here on this wax and I have it in my hot little hands. Wow. Yeah, I'm gonna turn this one up loud. 89 ice cream alone, 89 ice cream alone. What kind of Really? Am I, I mean, at this close range? Are you kidding? No, I've got a, I got a wide lens on. Hey man, I earned all these wrinkles. <laughs> I got a wide lens on. Oh, you do? Yeah, oh, oh yeah, you're far back. Okay. No, you're no, fine. No. I'm on him, don't worry. Convenience you. What, you look too comfortable. Okay, yeah, right? right? Johnny B, uh, man, what is the significance of this wonderful uh, ice cream frozen? It smells so good in there. Yeah, Juju's. I yeah. mean, it smells so good in there. And she was so sweet to accommodate us and everything, and even told us another location. I mean, Kurt's Kurt. father just recently. Well, what happened? Us. This was okay. a record store, Positively yeah. 4th Street, right? We at, yeah, we are at 208 West. What are we fourth. Sure I'm not, yeah, 208 West Fourth. This is the site of Positively Fourth Street, absolutely legendary record store we all used to come to. Why is this significant to uh, Nirvana? Well, the uh, old shop owner Wynn told me that this was the first record store in the world to actually stock and carry Nirvana. Nirvana Isn't records. that nuts? Yeah. So you know we'll have to get the fact checkers on that one, but that's what Wynn told me and uh, Wynn also um, had relayed to me if you're familiar with the movie Drugstore Cowboy yeah he told me that that movie was autobiographical and that actually was a story about him and that whole line of uh, it's bad luck to throw your hat on the bed you know I'd come in here and see him and he'd be like I told you not to throw the hat on the bed right that was but, his uh, thing yeah he was yeah he was amazing and uh, he actually had a lot of cats uh, you know, we showed you that photo maybe earlier of Kurt Cobain with his kitties and how yeah. he just loved the kitties. Well, uh, Wynn used to have some cats that used to roam wow. free in the store here. And uh, so you'd be browsing records and they'd drop by and say Let's hello. see some cats. Yeah, All anyway. right, so it's this place here. Yeah. 
Cascadia. It's a walk right to it. Apparently there's pictures of Kurt on the wall. He used to eat here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what this place was called uh, back in the day. Is it open? But uh, they used to host yeah, live open. music here. And uh, according to, uh, to Julia Juju, she was saying that Kurt used to frequent shows in this yeah. establishment. Let's check it out. Yeah. There's Dave. Cascadia. And the guy from Dallas, Bobby from Dallas. Um, while you're here, while we're doing everything. And there she is. There's Courtney herself. Just trying to find a picture of Kurt that's on the wall. There he is. There's Kurt right back there. Wait, you found him? Oh, there he is. There he is. That's right. Right where he belongs, by the beer shop. There he is. Oh, there he is. We're so told to check out the bathrooms. Northwest. Yeah. Yes, they're so funny, right there. All right. Jane. Dick and Jane. All right, well, let's stick oh. to our dick. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Holy jeez, look at yeah, all these. Whoa. Wow. Are these all, f wow. Well, Dick York or Dick Sarge, whatever that is, and uh, Dick Van Dyke. Oh, it's all dicks. That's why this is the dicks. Dick Cabot, right? Oh. Oh my God, this whole room. Andy Dick? Yes, <laughs> this whole room is full of famous dicks. Dick Clark. Dick Clark. Oh, dude, what, what, Wait, what was the why guy? Wait, Who's the guy? Eight is enough. D uh, Dick Van, uh, cause, uh, I went, I went to his, was Wait. it Dick Van Dyke? No, no, no. Dick Van, no, Dick. I don't know. Where, where's I don't my know, he's laptop? A pretty big dick. We, I we should need know to him. be Googling. We should know him because he's a pretty, pretty well known yeah, he's dick. A, he's a big dick. It's okay. I'll say it. I'll put it on the look screen. Look at Moby Dick. Yeah, he's about Moby Dick. But now look here. You got Randy Quaid as Eddie, cousin Eddie, and right? Clark W. Griswold. Oh, yeah. Maybe because Randy Quaid is such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the only. But otherwise, it's all dicks. Yeah. John Ham. That's kind of Ham Dick. Is that slang? I don't know. I don't know, was that his character name? Or? I don't know. Anyway, mind blown. Yeah, I've been surrounded by this many dicks since college. Yeah, this is a, this is a lot of dicks. Dick Todd, wow. Dick Spear. Swedish dicks. Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Dictaphone? That's a, yeah. Oh, the, the Dictaphone. <laughs> Dick Todd, I just don't like his other name. Oh my god. John Wayne the Duke, which is close to the dick. <laughs> <laughs> and so I get the door to the, in the whip. <laughs> oh, here. I love you, made dick. it yourself. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Jason Priestley, look at all these photos, random photos of celebrities and people everywhere. Uh, is that Mother Love Bone? Is that Mother Love Bone up there? Yeah. yeah. Wow. Very cool. All right, we're gonna go to another of Kurt's favorite restaurants, right? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> it's not a real thing anyway. All right, Johnny Nirvana. So, What's going on? what is this place, Spar Cafe? Well, you know, back in the day, I remember, uh, actually it used to be called the Spar Cafe and Bar, because at the back of this place, you know, uh, there was just like an old speakeasy looking style bar. I think this place has been around since maybe the 1930s. I mean, this is vintage Olympia. It's one of uh, Kurt's favorite places to come and grab a bite. Right, he right loved here. it here. This is this is original downtown Olympia. So he didn't, he didn't actually play any play or perform. We don't know for sure at the bar in the back, which is no longer there. It's just a big couple you of know, rooms. But you never know, right? I, well, I, I'm going to research that. As far as I know, no. But there. Uh, were some pretty legendary shows held in that back bar. I bet. And uh, a lot of people used to pour in there, you know, after shows at the Capitol Theater and other stuff downtown. Uh, that back bar was a real popular uh, kind of after show place too. All right, we going? Yeah. All right, I just looked on the plaque. The Spar Cafe and Bar opened in 1935. Incidentally, the same year that Elvis Aaron Presley was born. That's right. That's you know a little bit about Elvis, don't you? Oh, dude, that's a whole nother series of videos. <laughs> we'll but, get to uh, that. Love the king, man. He's, uh, he's so now where we're going? We're going to go to Evergreen okay, College and go to so the library where they play the show with you. Exactly. Well, first, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, we, we need a very very tall coffee. So yes. We're going to go to another Olympia institution, the Dancing Goat Coffee House, and get the largest coffee they got, and then we will drive speedily alone right. to 
the Evergreen State College. <laughs> get your records. And get in the trunk. You're getting too. You're getting too. Uh, <laughs> but I gotta ride in the trunk. I don't know. You're you're getting very hosty. Uh, you're taking over my job. I think I'm maybe too tall for the trunk. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, you'll fit. I got this belly at the Nom Nom Deli. Here we are, dancing goats. So, Johnny and Nirvana, we tried with security to get into the event hall where yeah. Nirvana played, but unfortunately you have to make an appointment well in advance. Yeah. But we just came here on a whim, you're alumni. Yeah, right? we just did kind of show up here, but I, I am a greener, class of 93. Right, let's come this way, the lights right. kind of okay, yeah, on your face, that's here. perfect, there you go. go yeah, so here. what happened? So you played here a gig, when yeah. was it roughly? Uh, let's see, yeah. Um, very first Nirvana show in Olympia in 1991 would have been in January of 91. Okay, the uh, Gulf War had just broken out. Right. Um, there was a lot of rumors going around that they were going to reinstate the draft, and right. uh, people were kind of feeling like, you know, hey, there's a lot of causes I will fight for for my country, but like protecting oil wells is not necessarily uh, part of that, and so. People were really um, like, you know, uh, I, I'm not going to be drafted. You know, they never did enact the draft, but that was kind of the right. sentiment at right. the time. So this was actually an anti-draft resistance show. Um, local legends. I was telling you about Mikey D's earlier. Yeah. Fits of Depression. Mikey Fitz was on the bill. Uh, my band, Goat Nut. Um, <laughs> who, uh, yeah, exactly. Our, our logo was uh, the god Pan cutting off his own testicles. Right. And this was uh, partially because, you know, the Riot Girl was, thing was going on. And so, you know, it was, it was a little scary to be a man on the campus. We were kind of under <laughs> really? attack. Really? No, but dude, I support the sisters. I am, I am all, you know, I get it. But I'm just saying, our logo was, you know, was the goat nut. Right. Uh, and then um, Hell Trout, who I told you about, yeah. the drummer in Hell Trout was none other than Dave Foster, who was Nirvana's original drummer. So their original drummer was on the, the same bill, because Dave was playing in the band at this point, right? Or was it Chad? Uh, it was Dave Grohl. It's Dave Grohl, yeah, cause cause they, yeah, it would be Dave Grohl. And so, so the opener, Hell Trout, for Nirvana, had the drummer that um, the very first time they played because they were playing under other names, right. but the very first time they played on stage as Nirvana was in Tacoma. Uh, at a house party. What was that called? I, I think a house party. I went to it. I went to that location oh, yeah, a okay. couple of years ago. Yeah. And, and the first, the first like official like venue was right. what, that World Theater or something in Tacoma. Can't remember. Anyway, no. uh, Dave Foster was the guy on the drums when they very first called themselves Nirvana. So yeah, he was in a band called Hell Trout. And then the ba other band was called Nubbin. Um, the guitar player's name was uh, Tim O'Ellis. He actually went on to play guitar with uh, Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono. Right, you, oh yeah, you yeah. Lives in New York. He's still just an amazing guitar player. Really, really talented. And Sibo Mato, I oh, think. Sibo Mato was here? Yeah, he was in, no, he was in Sibo Mato oh, for he was a while. In, yeah. So he was on the bill and then Nirvana played. Um, they opened the show. Uh, Chris Novoselic got up and gave a real like rousing political talk about you know the Gulf War and all this stuff. Right. <laughs> I feel sad about this contempt, and I really do. I I I just can't. I, I just can't get you know you know I feel sad about this contempt, but don't expect me to go flip off pro-war protest protesters like I've been flipped off as I protested. And. Uh, and then I can't remember if it was during the Hell Trout set or before the Nirvana set, but somebody pulled the fire alarm and they like made everybody leave the room. Right. I bet yeah. a few people went on this yeah. roof. Yeah, there was people out here on the roof and they, you know, they made us stand around until, oh, you know, all's clear. Then they let everybody back in. But uh, the other kind of highlight of the show was I remember Kurt Cobain at the end of the show, like 
just smashed, just obliterated his guitar with a hammer, <laughs> right? Just smash it. And the thing is, like, you know, he probably would have reconstructed that guitar uh, on the bench, right? In the right. garage, yeah, in the yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he just, he just like went after this guitar. Like it was, it was kind of scary how much he, uh, he destroyed this guitar. So it was right but, in that uh, room, huh? But then, yeah, actually Straight it's right ahead. down yeah. here. It's a uh, library 4300 is, um, in the uh, second apartment at Pear Street, um, that Scott's now living in. Not, not this Scott. Not our Scott, friend, our mutual friend not Scott. Not Scott on tape, but the tenant at Pear Street. In the second apartment in that house that um, Kurt moved into, there's actually a poster on that wall from this show, right. which is just legend. So yeah, this is it, Library 4300. Yeah. And it. Uh, it was amazing that. Even the staff, the people that worked here in this next door office, had no idea that this happened. When I showed up and said, "Hey, yeah, you know, played the show with Love Nirvana cool. in there," and they were, and they were fans. They were like, "That's so cool." Yeah. Um, Do you remember where the stage was? Is it off to the right of okay, the camera? So you're looking yeah, through the lens. Yeah. If you go follow this all the way to the right, against that back wall was going to be where the stage was. Yeah. Wow. So Nirvana closed the set. Where was where was your band on the uh, list? Uh, we were we were kind of right in the middle, and uh, you know I'm making no claims about how good we were about whatever. I think our band was together two or three weeks, and uh, I was really good friends with Hell Trout, and Hell Trout, as we said earlier, was on the bill with Nirvana at that show at the Rico Muse where they shot the Bleach cover, mm -hmm. and um, Hell Trout actually also. Uh, played a show in the K dorm here, K right. K208, and he don't uh, uh, God that show the floor literally was I, I don't even know it was like waves it was like made out of rubber I mean people were were moshing so hard yeah. that I just thought the whole thing was gonna cave in but um, it was amazing the first time I saw Nirvana. I was living out here in the modular housing with people around here just called them the mods. Right. And uh, somebody just was like, hey, dude, there's this band playing in the mods tonight. You should go check them out. And so I walked like, you know, throw a rock, you know, just right there, went in this show. And and uh, I sat down on the couch right next to Kurt. And, you know, he, he didn't really say much to to strangers. You know, he wasn't like the most affable guy. Like, you know, I'll talk to anybody, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, but um, apparently look at me. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, right. <laughs> but he, he, you know, he, he was kind of introverted and quiet, but you know, I sat down and then did have a conversation and, and then it, it was amazing. Like he's sitting on the couch next to me and then Chris was like, Kurt, time to play the show. And then he just hops up, straps on the lefty guitar and just starts blazing, just tore the place apart. And, the, and, and these mods are tiny, tiny mm -hmm. rooms, right? And everybody was just going nuts. Well, the, the front window of the mod was open, and I just remember I got moshed, 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 and then like moshed right out the front window. Oh, man. Yeah, totally landed on my head, like outside the show. So most of the people that were watching the show were actually outside because the place was tiny. And you, so you told me you ran into Kurt all the time. So you met him yeah. more than more than one occasion. But you told me yeah. an interesting story about him and marijuana. Oh well, um, yeah. I mean, you know, and we're not we're not telling I, secrets I out of school. Well, but you know, I don't, I don't want to self incriminate. You know, I have mm -hmm. kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, um, let's just say that you know Kurt maybe bogarted <laughs> the joint. If he gave him a joint, you didn't see the joint again. It was just one of those things where <laughs> you know, and, and and this may not be a general statement. I don't want to make some general statement. I can just say from experience that it was sort of like, hey, dude, you want to share this? And then you know what I mean. And it was just like, whoa, where you know, where'd he go? But uh, you know, yeah, Kurt had a had a love for the tree yeah. uh, for for a while there. You know, he had an old Dodge Dart. Right. He was driving around town. You just see him like in his beater, and then like where we, where we went to eat at the Spar Cafe. He'd be in there, or uh, King Solomon's Reef that recently it just closed literally yeah. last week. What were you telling me about King Solomon's Reef? What were, what were you telling me about? Well, that King Solomon's Reef had a bar in the back called the Reef Room. Right. That was just just legendary. Like I mean, the thing is, like nobody has a story from the reef room because nobody remembers walking out of there. You know, it was just 
Um, it was one of those things where like, you know, they're pouring the drink like this, you know, whiskey, 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 shh, Coke, right? right? I mean, it was... Uh, and so Kurt hung out there a lot. Yeah, and, and well, the thing was is, you know, Kurt uh, loved his mac and cheese. Right. And so, you know, and, and he made at Pear Street, you know, he made a lot of boxes. I think Kraft Mac mm. and Cheese was his brand, you know, and it was cheap. But, um, you know, you'd sometimes go in and walk in the reef room and he'd be over in the booth just having his mac and cheese, you know. Crazy. Yeah, it was wild. Making it at home than going out and ordering it. <laughs> yeah, so. and it's like, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you could, back then, you could buy a box for, what, 19 cents? Yeah, so downstairs in the basement, there's a TV studio. Nirvana did a 30-minute show yeah and Kurt did the chroma key background for it with all these different weird commercials and clips of movies and then yeah. dolls from the apartment yeah, We're yeah. Gonna, let's go see if we can see that TV yeah, studio so I, I, I real quick you know yeah. uh, I, I, I talked to my friend uh, Don well and Dave Foster who we said was Nirvana's first drummer yeah. and and their recollections of, of going to Kurt's apartment is they walked in there and he just had discombobulated you know like doll parts and 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 different you know uh just all, all kinds of what oh god what was the word they used but anyway you know he was he had an old super 8 camera yeah and he was he was attempting stop motion film, right, right he was making like really early stop and motion. some of those you can see in the background of that show that was filmed down below correct you can see them in the and last so song floyd the, the barber right and yeah. so yeah floyd the barber the the evergreen tv studio is in this basement and and you're right, it used a bunch of uh, video Kurt made at Pear Street yeah. in, in the video. So let's go check yeah, out. Let's the see if we can get in. So security and the manager told me it was Studio A. They knew about it. And Nirvana played in here, a 30-minute show. Wow. Wow. Johnny Nirvana, that's it. We're done. You, we've, we could probably do another tour another time of more places with Kirk, couldn't we? You think of some yeah. more places. Yeah, there's definitely more places. It's hard to really uh, go anywhere in Olympia that, that Kurt didn't hang out. But uh, well, we did it. it's amazing, yeah. actually, uh, the relationship between Nirvana and the, and the Evergreen College over the years. They, they really were embraced by uh, the kids here at Evergreen. Early, yeah. early on, people were definitely fans, and uh, I think it was it was when. I hope when, the kids on campus now. Yeah. Did I say kids on campus? The no. kids, but no, they are. Here's the thing. I hope they're fans of Nirvana. No, here's the thing. Okay, I had the the alumni association call me, and they're you know trying to solicit donations. Oh, you're an alumni. You want to kick in? What year did you attend Evergreen? Oh yeah, I was here like you know late '80s to like '93. What you were? Yeah saw Nirvana play in the mods. What? Mm. I heard Kurt Cobain signed his name under the sink in that mod, bro. <laughs> but I went out there, I could not find any signature. But there probably is- Probably new sinks are probably not true. You know, in <laughs> people who know, there is definitely a mythology that has grown up oh. around Nirvana's time at Evergreen. Oh, of course, and it's, Kurt, Kurt is, is, is almost such a legend. He's like a mythological uh, figure to so many people. Well, and, especially you know, the younger people nowadays. I got to be honest. All right, you know, thirty years on, I'm a bigger fan of Nirvana now right. than I was then. And of yeah, we were all the that. bands, of all the bands that came out of that era, like I, I think their music stands up the best. I think it's it's still just as vibrant. I don't know. I'm gonna have to go ahead and now. disagree with you because I think Goat Nut was probably the biggest well, band to come out dude, of. Dude, you know, if those Goat Nut tapes, <laughs> had, had if those surfaced, Goat Nuts could talk, if those Goat Nuts could talk. <laughs> I nicknamed them Joy Nirvana, by the way. So, yeah. like we said at the beginning, you don't yeah, call listen, yourself that. Listen, yeah, I, I don't. Hey, 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 listen. I don't want anybody thinking that I equate myself somehow with Nirvana. Where would you get that idea? You know I don't know, but I mean? I'm taking those back home with me. No, I don't know. I, I might be borrowing these. But the thing is, like I said, he, he just, I want to thank Scott right now for going oh, with thanks. this tour on me. Uh, on me. Memory Shit. lane for you and oh, just for going blowing on this my mind. Tour with me because, uh, you know, he, he, he really uh, 
Uh, I think he does a great job, and he really wants to be thorough, and he wants to tell the story right. So yes. if there's anything, it's been a lot of years, right? So if there's anything that I said on this show that is, is, is not factual or contradictory, forgive me, like put it in the comments. We want to hear from you. Yeah. And, and uh, let me know, you know, I, I'm just saying, like we didn't know what was coming. We didn't yeah, see, yeah. we did not see that tsunami coming. It was just like picture your little local band that you go see at the local bar every weekend, and then picture that band in six months becoming the biggest band in the world. I mean, it was something no one no saw one that saw coming. No one they, saw they, that they, tsunami they coming. They booted Michael Jackson off from number one on the right. Billboard Hot 100. Right. Michael Jackson, Nirvana. They beat brought them. punk. To the mainstream mm -hmm. and and just you know i always say that you know grunge really was sort of like hippies marrying punk it was like yeah. it was like hippie punk it was like long-haired punkers that smoked a lot of weed and you know chris novacella you know never wore shoes on stage what's that hippie shit that is some hippie shit yeah that's washington um, state that's washington state for you mm -hmm. but what happened here unique you know, it's, right, it, it's not going to happen again. <laughs> but Scott, peace out. All right. <laughs> I, just, I didn't mean to interrupt well, wait, you. I, I don't know what you're at. No, I thought, I, listen. I, I thought you were wrapping it up. I, 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 I can gab. I can go on. <laughs> you, you know what I, I do. I can, I can tell stories. But uh, I, I actually, I want you. Oh, tell viewer, me another story. I want Hester him. Right. I want everybody in the comments, pester him. Like, I want to be his Ed McMahon. I feel like <laughs> I think I feel so. Like, I, I feel after like that live your, chat, your side man, and the live chat. You know, I can be the Google, like I can look up stuff or whatever. But you know what I mean. I feel like we should team up. But you know what? I my I see. I I let you tell a lot of stories because I was fascinated by them. But my friend Adam, who's a YouTuber, um, every time I start to tell a story on his channel, and I say, I know you might edit this out, and he edits it out every time as a oh. joke. He thinks it's really funny. So tell me a story that I'm not going to edit out, dude. I no listen.